हरे कृष्णा ओम ज्ञान तिरंध्य ज्ञानाजन शलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मील तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा ओम विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतीता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू बी हियर विद ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे एंड फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई लाइक टू हैप्रिशिएट एंड कॉन्ग्रेचुलेट ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर एस एस चेन्नई टेम्पल मैनेजमेंट एंड डिवोश इन द विजनिंग team for the, for organizing this very distinctive festival we appreciate the contribution of vishwanath chakravarti thakur so vishwanath chakravarti thakur's uh, contributions are among the most uh, foundational and reliable in the gaudiya vaishnav tradition and yet his glories are not known very widely beyond our tradition just uh, just a week before i received this invitation to speak on this topic i have been talking with several young devotees who are pursuing academic studies and they may be the first in the world to do their doctorates on vishwanath chakravarti thakur the starting acharyas in our sampradaya rupa goswami and jeev goswami have been widely studied and the recent acharyas Shri Prabhupada, Bhakti Sanskar Thakur, Bhakti Nath Thakur have also been widely studied, but Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has not been studied so much outside our tradition. Personally, I am grateful to His Holiness Bhanu Maharaj because it was his translate, it was his translations of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur that actually introduced me to the treasure house, the of uh, bhakti that is there in. Chakravarti Pad's uh, writings. So I will focus here on in today's session on how the how Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur envisions or he compares studying the Bhagavatam with churning the ocean. He says that while churning, many things came out. The nectar came out, but also Mohini came out. and bhagavatam can be like nectar uh, or bhagavatam or when we approach bhagavatam the bhagavatam from the bhagavatam nectar can come out or mohini can also come out so, he, so now he takes the, he develops this metaphor of churning in a very beautiful way so let's try to look at the metaphor we, we developing the metaphor so as i said the ocean in the in the churning there is the ocean that is churned so that is the bhagavatam and for churning a rod that is required and that is the particular resource we use for studying the bhagavatam and then from churning the results come out from the churning of the milk ocean as i said mohini came out from there nectar came out from there so like that so now what does this mean well, here the last i would say the first and the second first and third columns are fairly clear what does the second column mean when we say the resource we use for studying bhagavatam what does this mean so we can say what we churn with and what we get from the churning so if we use our buddhi buddhi refers here to the to understanding of sanskrit grammar understanding of language structure understanding of primarily the structure of the bhagavatam we if we use buddhi then we will get one level of understanding from the bhagavatam and he says only when we approach the bhagavatam with bhakti that does not mean buddhi is not there but when the primary tool for approaching the bhagavatam is bhakti 
that is when there is a deeper level of understanding and this is where krishna will manifest in the heart so avruddhite takshanat in the second verse of the bhagavatam in the first three verses are very important it says that avruddhite it's, it's manifesting it's not that we we sort of capture krishna with our buddhi rather with our bhakti krishna manifests automatically so now it's significant that he does not dismiss buddhi but he does not enthrone buddhi as the topmost way of charnik if we if we read the chaitanya charitamrita especially chaitanya bhagavat there are descriptions of how people at those time would recite the bhagavatam but there was no bhakti in their approach to the bhagavatam and that's why they came up with non non devotional or non personal conclusions from the bhagavatam so let's try to understand this a little bit better i'll come back to this again but it's something which has been elaborated by bhakti nath thakur also in his chaitanya shikshamrut and his krishna samhita so he puts it in a different way he doesn't exactly use the churning metaphor but i am extending with the metaphor that vishwanath chakra thakur has used to bhakti nath thakur's approach bhakti nath thakur takes similar like basically the idea is there are multiple results that can come from the churning of the bhagavatam so at the kanishta level he now he is not using this these three terms kanishta madhyam uttama in terms of the kanishta adhikari madhyam adhikari uttama adhikari of the bhakti rasamrut sindhu he is using these terms simply as like a initial level intermediate level and highest level when we when he says when somebody studies the bhagavatam at the kanishta level they focus on the literal okay this is what the word says this is what the letter says and they focus on the literal understanding this is the date this is the year this is the dimension they focus on the literal aspects only then he says that uh, beyond that when somebody comes at the madhyama level they start looking for universal principles what is it that the bhagavatam is teaching through this and then at the uttama level one goes to savor the transcendental savor krishna so i'll explain this a little further again but let's look at how different people can approach the bhagavatam in different ways that is mentioned in the bhagavatam itself so the bhagavatam has this famous verse akamah sarva kamo va moksha kamo udaradhi tivrena bhakti yogena yajet purusham param so what this verse means is that different people may approach bhakti in different ways and for whatever desire they may come uh, desire, with whatever desire may come they may come they will get the corresponding results now with this understanding uh, he also gives the example of uh, of how when krishna was in mathura at that time when he entered into the wrestling arena different people saw krishna differently and we know that chaitanya mahaprabhu himself gave multiple meanings of the atmaram verse in his discussions first with sarobh bhattacharya and then with sanatan goswami and now here the focus is slightly different earlier it was buddhi and bhakti now here it is what kind of desire is one approaching the bhagavatam with if one approaches with material desires one will get material pleasure in the heavens if one approaches with the desire of liberation one will get liberation if one approaches with the desire uh, with no worldly desires then one will get krishna so although at one level the buddhi bhakti as churning and then uh, different kinds of desires as churning rod they may seem different they are actually ultimately the same thing because bhakti means no desire other than the desire for krishna so what the, how does he approach the bhagavatam he talks about how there are when we want to churn basically let's look at this way first he says that there are just like prabhu pad talks about there are five main things in the bhagavad gita based on baldev vidyabhushan's teachings here chakravarti pad says there are five main teachings or five main principles you can say for understanding the essence of the bhagavatam so that means the idea is when we have churned how do we know that we have got the real result of churning or we have got something else just like in the actual churning the ocean leela 
Lord Vishnu tells the devatas initially. Many other things will come out of the churning, but don't get distracted by them. Focus, continue churning till you find till you get the nectar. So these five essential themes of the Bhagavatam, which if we reach these, then we can say that we have actually understood the essence of the Bhagavatam. What are these five themes? So first he says, now each of these, I have, I have not gone into the verses which he talks about to substantiate these points. I just kept this non-technical. The first is that Bhagavatam is non-different from Vedanta Sutra. It is non-different from the Vedas, the Puranas. Nigama Kalpatvara or Galitam Palam, as the Bhagavatam itself says. And then we may study many things through the Bhagavatam, but the essential teaching of the Bhagavatam is centered on Krishna. And then there are many aspects of Krishna that are talked about in the Bhagavatam. But among them all, Krishna's relationship with the gopis is the topmost. And Krishna is conquered by Radharani. And finally, Krishna is realized by bhakti, not by anything else. Now, if we move forward, now there are multiple metaphors and he uses one particular metaphor to elaborate how the Bhagavatam can be understood in different ways. In, so the Bhagavatam is compared to a lamp which can show us the way when we are lost in the darkness. Uh, now, uh, these four metaphors, each of them has its specific significance. And I will explain the significance uh, after we go through the four metaphors. Now, the lamp metaphor, it signifies that the generally when we talk about a lamp, it is something we need to hold up. I hold up the lamp in front of me so that I can see ahead of me. Whereas it also uses the famous sun metaphor, Krishna Swadham Opagate. At that time when it uses the metaphor, the idea is that just when Krishna has disappeared, the Bhagavatam has arisen as the sun. So what this means is, we don't control the sun, we don't hold up the sun, the sun arises on its own. What these two metaphors mean is, at one level, the Bhagavatam is something which is revealed by higher arrangement. But at the same time, we also have to make endeavor so that we are illumined by the Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada would say that there is no need to interpret when the meaning is meaning is evident, meaning is self-evident. But then Prabhupada himself wrote elaborate purports. If the meaning is self-evident, then why are even Prabhupada's purports needed? Because the idea is that Although the Bhagavatam's meaning may be evident, it may not be evident to us. The sun is there in the sky, but the sun can get covered by clouds. And neither the sun nor the clouds are in our control. When the sun rises, when the sun sets is not in our control. When the clouds come and when the clouds go, even that is not in our control. So if you consider where this particular metaphor is used, this one, two, three, the other, the lamp metaphor is used where Suta Goswami is offering his obeisances to his Guru Shukadev Goswami. And this Puranarka Adhanodita, that verse comes when Suta Goswami is describing to the sages how when the Krishna has when Krishna has departed, the Bhagavatam has arisen. So, in one sense, oh, when the sun is there in the sky and there are no clouds covering it, then we don't need the lamp. But as long as the sun is covered by the clouds, we cannot directly access the light from the sun. The same light from the sun, it is present in a small fragment in the lamp. And the lamp is what helps us see the path ahead for us. So in one sense, you can say this verse refers to the, the sun metaphor refers to the universal mercy. It is out of Krishna's mercy on the entire universe in Kaliuga that he has on his mercy on everyone that he has manifested as the Bhagavatam. But the, we getting the lamp is like the personal mercy we get by the blessings of our gurus. And that brings us to the third metaphor that when there is a ripe fruit, it needs to be carefully passed down till the person who is going to savor it. Now, the, the metaphor of the ripe fruit is, uh, is very significant because normally we think that a fruit that is ripe stays ripe for some time before it is raw 
and after that it becomes rotten so is it like that for the bhagavatam also that if it is a ripe fruit that means it is ripe only for a particular time before or after it is not no the bhagavatam is eternal at the same time if the fruit is ripe in different ways for different sadhakas that means that this is where bhagavatam uses the word uh, it talks about the ripened fruit where pibata bhagavatam rasamalayam that it is to be relished it is to be drunk it is to be savored it is rasa that is to be got from the bhagavatam now that means that the bhagavatam brings in a very personal dimension to our relationship with the bhagavatam that it is not just like an object to be analyzed okay this is a like like a physics object okay this is this much this is height this is weight this is mass this is speed no the bhagavatam is non different from krishna and it is we who have to relish this ripened fruit so now that brings us to the last metaphor which he uses the mohini metaphor for the bhagavatam so now what he says is mohini is krishna and yet that mohini took some toward nectar and some away from nectar we know in the in the amrut manthan leela took some refer to the devatas the devatas were taken toward the nectar mohini personally gave them the nectar and the asuras what happened to them was they were taken away from the nectar so similarly says depending on how we are approaching the bhagavatam we may by the study of the bhagavatam go toward krishna or go away from krishna now we wonder how can by the study of the bhagavatam somebody go away from krishna how is that possible so what that means is that with it is within the bhagavatam somebody may get caught or captivated by something other than krishna that could mean that somebody gets caught in the language of the bhagavatam and what does this mean what does this mean somebody can get caught in the grammar of the bhagavatam somebody can caught, get caught in the cosmology of the bhagavatam somebody can get caught in the chronology of the bhagavatam somebody can even get caught in the philosophy of the bhagavatam now all these are parts of the bhagavatam and all these are important in their own way but if somebody gets caught in those and then doesn't reach krishna then that is what is happening is they are bhagavatam is manifesting as mohini for them and they are not able to reach krishna rather they go away from krishna and then he gives the, he he echoes what jiva goswami talks about in the sandarbhas and he said there are some leelas in the bhagavatam which are specifically asura mohan leela so what is the uh, asura mohan leela so for example if he say he talks about krishna's disappearance past time when people hear about krishna disappearance past time and they get caught how could krishna leave a body behind how could krishna die because of an arrow hitting his leg and they may take this past time and by that they will conclude krishna cannot have been god and they will neglect everything else in the bhagavatam where krishna has even gone to yama's abode and got his sons back from yama's abode they will forget they will overlook those past times and they will focus only on this particular past time and they will miss on they will they will mistake krishna's position now what does this mean for all of us so we sometimes even struggle to find time to study the bhagavatam we struggle to find maybe in half an hour an hour or sometimes we just hear the bhagavatam classes whenever we get time we not able to study the bhagavatam systematically given the kind of schedules that we have in today's world what it means essentially is that whenever we are studying the bhagavatam if we are clear okay this bhagavatam is like an ocean i cannot cover the entire ocean but why am i churning the ocean if we focus on that you know there is one level of churning which is how how does this verse connect with this verse how does this chapter connect with that chapter how does this section connect with this section that is first level churning if we can do it well and good but not everybody can do it and not everybody needs to do it the second level churning is second order churning is why am i studying the bhagavatam we are studying the bhagavatam for the same purpose that parikshit maharaj was studying that is to remember krishna so there are many aspects in the study of bhagavatam 
and every aspect of the study of the bhagavatam can itself be like a universe if you study the fifth canto cosmology that itself can be a universe if you study the third canto sankhya that itself can be an entire universe if you study the ninth canto chapters 10 and 11 ram leela that itself is an entire universe where we can study so much more so what we need is to be clear it is not that the first technical study should not be done that is wonderful if somebody wants to do it but we can never let the technical study come in the way of the essential study the essential purpose so just like when the churning happened when the churning happened various things came out and initially when the horse ucheshrava came out then airavat elephant came out so uchesh the horse was taken by bali maharaj the elephant airavat got so airavat indra got so different people got different things but the devtas didn't get caught in fighting oh this is mine this is mine i have to get this i have to get this oh, if i get it good if i don't get it doesn't matter i'll keep churning cuz what i really want is the nectar sometimes even in the study of the bhagavatam there there can come up uh, controversies and unnecessary fights over issues that are not uh, not central to the study of the bhagavatam so for example if we consider now this is a problem in every religious tradition that people can got get caught in the technicals and lose out on the essentials for example in medieval christianity there were big polemical debates between various christian theologians on one question and if you hear that question you will laugh out at the, at its absurdity so for the question is that how many angels can dance on the tip of a needle now we say what kind of question is this how many angels can dance on the tip of a needle but that is a, that is the kind of argument this is a rhetorical question which was raised to indicate how people can get caught in trivials and while they were caught in the trivials christian theologians were got caught in the trivials what happened was science was advancing and science came up and completely overwhelmed medieval christianity and religion has since then been on the retreat so when we study the bhagavatam it is we can we can ask ourselves okay i'm churning the bhagavatam right now what is coming out of it is krishna coming out of it or am i getting caught by other things while i'm studying the bhagavatam so in the bhagavatam verses or sometimes in the bhagavatam commentaries we may find certain statements which in today's uh today's way of thinking we may sometimes find very difficult to understand or digest so there may be some statements about women there may be some statements about lower caste people there may be some statements about certain races and today we may feel hey, what is this I, i can't i can't digest this so if we find some statements which are very which which are which were very agitating or very difficult for us in the bhagavatam the approach we can have is what bhagavatam itself says nati sakto nati nirvinno not too attached not too averse we we have to ourselves carefully analyze is this is this statement related to the essential message of the bhagavatam if not then i will not get too i will not make it a matter of fighting i have to prove this is right nor do i have to start fighting to prove it is wrong no just put it aside keep what uh, suspend judgment about it and move on toward krishna and this is the beauty of chakravarti pad's uh, analysis of the bhagavatam how he so beautifully focuses on the on giving us our, the rasa the taste the taste of relishing krishna through his bhagavatam commentaries in fact i'll conclude with one point which chakravarti pad makes in his commentary that what is the greatest need of humanity today now he's talking about you are today means in kaliyuga during his times also and that applies even today for us so he says the greatest need for people is to get the higher taste and we as students and sharers of the bhagavatam we need to help people either experience the higher taste or discover the path to getting the higher taste so we all can pray chakravarti pad that 
this glimpses of rasa glimpses of higher taste that he has given in his commentaries through his commentaries to us that we also can focus on seeking krishna seeking the rasa centered on krishna that the bhagavatam is given and thus we all can become rasika those who are connoisseurs of rasa so i'll summarize briefly what i spoke today and then we can have a few questions or comments so first thing i spoke is about how chakravarti pad uses the churning metaphor to understand how to explain how different things may be revealed when we study the bhagavatam so if we use buddhi we will get one level of understanding by studying the grammar the sanskrit the structure of the bhagavatam but when we approach with bhakti that is when krishna avruddhate krishna will manifest through our study of the bhagavatam now this does not mean that buddhi is to be neglected but rather in approaching the bhagavatam with buddhi we should not get caught in things other than krishna <clears throat> i also discussed about how uh, when we approach with bhakti what does it mean we gain rasa and uh, bhakti no thakur talks about how kanishthas the kanishtha level of approaching the shastra is just focus on the literal uh, literal details the madhyama way is look for universal principles but the uttama way is relish the transcendental lord so then we discussed how can we know whether we are relishing the rasa of the bhagavatam for that discuss the essential teachings of the bhagavatam are centered on how the bhagavatam is non different from the vedanta sutra the bhagavatam's key teaching is krishna krishna's love with the gopis is the highest revelation of the bhagavatam krishna is conquered by the love of radha rani and it is bhakti through which the bhagavatam is discovered so if our understanding from the bhagavatam is aligning with these truths then we are moving closer to the nectar otherwise we are going away from it and then each of us can check whether we are getting caught in in contra- in controversies that are not relevant to the core of the bhagavatam and we avoid that and focus on gaining higher taste the taste of krishna and sharing that higher taste with others thank you very much hare krishna are there any reflections questions corrections so we have one question from <coughs> jyoti shankar mata ji <coughs> vishwana chakra thakur says in his uh, first verse the devotees of being the rightful recipients are considered to be like the devatas means they receive the nectar in the form of relishing the rare taste <coughs> prabhu ji can you please comment on this yes thank you <coughs> this is exactly the related to the point which i was discussing sometimes we we consider devatas to be like unimportant or not pure devotees or something like we consider devatas to be lower level beings however the point is that the devatas were assist devatas were guided by Vish, lord vishnu to churn the nectar and get get the final nectar so similarly here the bhag here chakravarti pad is saying that we are also meant to be like the devatas take the guidance of the lord and make sure that we stay focused till we attain the nectar there is another question from rajkumar prabhu <clears throat> when is in contact with krishna katha by reading bhagavatam how can we be diverted from krishna by reading bhagavatam thank you so uh, how everything we connected everything with the bhagavatam is krishna katha is so uh how can we become diverted yes that is that is the whole point that at one level we can say the whole material world is also non different from krishna that uh, that it is at one level uh, the pure devotee see sthavar jangam na dekhi na dekhi sar na dekhi sar sthavar jangam it is about said mahaprabhu na sthavar jangam na dekhi na dekhi tar murti sarvatra hai nija ishta deva spurti that mahaprabhu didn't see anything as material he saw everywhere krishna so similarly at one level the bhagavatam is entirely non different from krishna however when we are studying the bhagavatam what is it that we are focusing on it is say somebody comes to a temple the whole temple is non different from krishna but somebody may come to a temple and see the architecture of the temple and they may think oh you know i want to build a palace like this for myself and i want this kind of architecture in my home and the thing that they remember after going to the temple and coming back is not how beautiful or how wonderful the deities were but 
how I can earn enough money to build a palace like this for myself with this kind of architecture. So that is that is how we can get diverted. Yes, that Bhagavatam is non different from Krishna, but but we depending on the the desire with which we are approaching, and how long we hold, how strongly we hold on to that desire, that will determine whether we go toward Krishna or go away from Krishna. Hope that answers the question. That's a very wonderful response. Thank you. So <clears throat> one question uh, of the five key themes of Bhagavatam, which you said, uh, one is Krishna is conquered by Shri Radharani. But uh, as we know, it is not directly evident from Bhagavatam this particular aspect of uh, Radharani. <clears throat> so how do you understand this? Yes, it's a very important point. That so he also is continuing the churning metaphor that when we look at the ocean, we don't see the nectar over there. All that we see is the water only. But it's only when the ocean is churned. That is the time when the nectar comes out of it. So like that, just as the nectar is hidden within the ocean, similarly, Radha, these five points, including Radharani's glory, this is there in the Bhagavatam, but it is hidden. It has to be churned to be brought out. So in one sense, the Bhagavatam throughout its narrative is, is inverting conventional hierarchies. That means normally those who are considered higher, they are shown to be lower. So a Brahmana or a Brahmana's son is shown to be short-tempered, but a Kshatriya is shown to be very even-tempered and very focused on transcendence. That is Shringi and Parikshit Maharaj right in the beginning. So the same theme of those which are considered to be materially very powerful or prominent, they are shown to be less important and those with devotion even if they are not materially prominent, they are shown to be very powerful. That is there in almost every canto of the Bhagavad. So Suniti is not very beautiful. She is not very influential in the king's court. But it is she who leads her son to the Lord. Whereas Su Suruchi, she can't even save her son from his own death eventually. And same way, we have Rutrasura the Asura. But he attains the Supreme Lord, whereas Indra stays uh, stays on in the material world attached. Similarly, a sannyasi Brahmana who can go all the way to Vaikuntha is not able to please Vish Lord Vishnu, but a Grahastha king who doesn't even go out of his palace gets the personal weapon of Lord Vishnu for his protection, Sudarshan Chakra. That is Parik that is Ambarish Maharaj and Durvasa Muni. So in that same mood of those who are materially, materially not even noticeable, being spiritually more most prominent, like that the Bhagavatam ultimately shows that these gopis of Rindavan, they're simple cowherd women, but they are the topmost devotees. And even among them, a gopi whose name is also not mentioned, but she, even without her name being mentioned, is shown to be the most special devotee in the most special pastime of the Bhagavatam. That's why churning is so important. Without the churning, there are so many things in the Bhagavatam which we'll miss out. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Very wonderful. Thank Vishwanath you. Chakra Thakur Ki Jai. <clears throat> Shri Prabhupad Ki Jai. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Nithai Gaur Primanandi. Hari Hari Bhavad. Krishna, want to say some concluding note? It is our greatest fortune. It's, I mean, it's been a long awaited uh, hearing from Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. The topic, the churning that he has taken is so wonderful. We are extremely grateful to you. Thank you, Prabhu, and all the best for this wonderful festival that you have planned. My fortune to be a part of it. I pray that we all can relish Chakravarti Pad's gift of rasa, of higher taste. That he's providing us. The subject is so, uh, the subject as well as the speaker is so nice. He's only as Banasai Maharaja was present most of the time for the classes. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. One chakra for the Vishakar Pass and Devacha. Atitana, Pawan, Hirish, Rona, Mona, Ananda Poti, Vaishna, and the Pajay, Namacha, the Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you.